Hello, friends. Thank you for joining us for one more session of Kardec After Lunch, where we're going to be reading from one of Kardec's works. We, of course, hosted by Kardec Radio. And uh, feel free to download Kardec Radio's app for free, available for iOS and Android. Send questions, comments, and suggestions to Kardec Radio's Twitter account. And remember that although all of this work is done by volunteers, there are costs associated with web and app hosting, along with publishing. So if you're able to, please consider making a donation so this work of love may continue for many years to come. Uh, as if you have been with us for uh, some time, you know that we read uh, the Medium's book on Fridays, okay? And we do it sequentially, we only do 15 minutes, very quick and to the point. Uh, we are open to uh, collaboration, so if you like to send questions, comments, and suggestions, please feel free to. Um, if you happen to have the book with you, and I suggest you follow along or reading, we are on page number 173. We're talking about transfiguration. We are on chapter, sorry, on paragraph number 123, and it goes like this. In certain cases, transfiguration can occur as the result of a simple muscular contraction that can cause a very different facial expression to such a degree that the person becomes unrecognizable. We have often observed this in a few somnambulists. However, in this case, transformation is not radical. A woman may appear to be young or old, beautiful or homely, but she will always be the same woman and her weight will neither increase nor decrease. However, in the case of the young lady, there was obviously something more involved. The theory of the peri spirit will send us in the right direction. We accept, in principle, that the spirit can give its peri spirit any appearances it chooses, and by modif modifying its molecular arrangement, it can render it visible and tangible, and consequently opaque that while separate from the body, the perispirit of a living individual can undergo the same transformations, and that this change of state occurs through a combining of fluids. Next, let us imagine the perispirit of a living person, not separated from the body, but instead radiating all around the body in such a way as to envelop it like a kind of vapor. In this state, it can undergo the same modifications as when it is away. If it loses its transparency, the body can seem to disappear, to become invisible and veiled as if it had been immersed in some kind of fog. It can even change its appearance and become luminous depending on the will or power of the spirit. If another spirit were to combine its own fluids with those of the former, it could substitute itself for the person's appearance in such a way that his or her real body disappears, covered by an exterior fluidic envelope whose appearance can vary as the spirit wills it. This appears to be the true cause of this strange phenomenon. And we must state that transfiguration is quite rare. The difference in weight can be explained in the same way as the change in inert objects. That is, the intrinsic weight of the body itself does not vary since the amount of its matter does not increase. Instead, the body is influenced by an outside agent that can increase or decrease its relative weight. Therefore, the transfiguration into the form of a child would probably decrease the weight proportionally. Now, <clears throat> not going to, of course, discuss this at length, but it seems that the transfiguration that will go from perhaps a larger body to a smaller body uh, will be uh, perhaps a little more difficult, I guess I would venture to say than one that goes from a smaller body to a larger body in appearance, right? But 
And then we go to invisibility. Number 124. We can understand that the body can take on larger appearance than its own or an equal one. But how can he assume this smaller appearance of a child as we have just proposed? And I was not reading her head, but I guess just logical sequency of uh, subject led me to that interrogation. In such a case, wouldn't the real body supersede the limits of the apparent one? Like I was mentioning, that is why we have not said that such an occurrence has ever been actually produced. By referring to the theory of specific weight, we simply wanted to show that the apparent weight might also decrease. As for the phenomena per se, we will neither affirm nor deny its possibility. However, if it is indeed possible, the fact that we cannot explain it satisfactorily does not invalidate it. We must not forget that we are still at the beginning of this science and that it is still far away Sorry, far from having said the final word concerning this point as well as many others. Besides, the parts of the body that would exceed the limits of the smaller one could perfectly well be rendered invisible. I guess that would make sense, right? Um, well, let's continue reading. Perhaps it will answer my question. <clears throat> the invisibility theory naturally highlights the preceding explanations and those that refer to the apportation phenomenon. Number 125, we might have added a brief discussion of the strange phenomenon of Agenir. And there's a footnote, number 24, I suggest you look it up. Which, as extraordinary as it might appear at first glance, it is no more supernatural than any of the other, others. But since we have already explained it in the Review Spirit of February 1859, we believe it would not be worthwhile to go into detail at this time. We would simply state that it is a variety of tangible apparition and a state of certain spirits who can momentarily assume the forms of living persons so as to produce a perfect illusion. Then we head on to chapter eight. Okay, we're talking about a laboratory of the invisible world. <clears throat> and the first uh, topic is spirit clothing, the spontaneous formation of tangible objects. Number 126. We have stated that spirits often appear dressed in tunics. <clears throat> Sorry enveloped in flowing drapery or in ordinary clothes. Flowing drapery seems to be what is generally worn in the spirit world. However, we might ask where they find clothes that are similar in every way that those worn in life, along with all the added accoutrements. accoutrements. They obviously did not take these objects with them, since such objects remain behind with us, so where do they obtain the clothing they wear in the other world? This is a highly intriguing question, but for many, it is no more than mere curiosity. And personally, I do treat it as such. Many of the things uh, perhaps uh, expose uh, in this book and uh, perhaps works of Andrea Luiz in regards to Nosolar or Astro City. To me, they're no more than mere curiosity. Uh, not to say they don't have value, of course they do, but to me, what's most important is not, for example, uh, my way of locomotion in the spirit world. It doesn't matter if I'm gonna be walking, crawling, being wheeled back and forth or in the levitating bus, but really matters is what I, as a person, as a spirit, have done to fulfill my responsibilities while incarnate according to the incar incarnatory plan that we decided upon, right? But let's continue. Nevertheless, it raised a very important issue whose solution led us to discover a general law that might be equally applied 
to our own corporeal world. Numerous facts have complicated the subject and have exposed the insufficiency of suggested theories. Up to a certain point, the existence of clothing per se would be acceptable because we could regard it as being in some way part of the individual. However, the same cannot be said regarding accoutrements, such as the snuffbox of the man who visited the ill lady discussed in number 116. We should note that in that particular case, we were not dealing with a deceased person, but a living one, and that when the visitor returned in person, he had an identical snuffbox. Then, where did the spirit find the one used at the foot of the ailing woman's bed? We could cite numerous cases in which the spirits of both deceased and living individuals appeared with various objects such as sticks, weapons, tobacco pipes, lanterns, books, etc. We then had an idea. Inert objects might have ethereal correspondence in the visible world, and the condensed matter that forms various objects might contain a quintessential component that our senses cannot detect. Although this theory was not devoid of probability, it could not explain all the facts. There was one in particular that appeared to frustrate all interpretations. Until then, we had only dealt with images or appearances, and we had already seen that the perispirit can assume the properties of matter and render itself tangible. But this tangibility is temporary, and solid objects can vanish like shadows. Such a phenomenon is in and of itself quite extraordinary, but what is even more impressive is the production of matter that remains solidified, which has been demonstrated by numerous authenticated occurrences, notably those involve direct writing, which we shall return to in more detail in a special chapter. However, since this phenomena are intimately, sorry, intimate, sorry, intimately connected to our present subject and represent one of its more positive manifestations, we shall anticipate the order by making a few preliminary remarks at this time. Number 127. Direct writing or pneumatography is writing that is produced spontaneously without the medium using his or her hand or a pencil. All that is needed is a clean sheet of paper which can be prepared taking all necessary precautions in order to prevent any kind of fraud. The paper is folded and placed somewhere in a drawer or simply on a piece of furniture. Under the proper conditions, within a certain amount of time, letters or various words, sorry, various marks, words, sentences, and even entire communications will appear on the paper, usually in some dark substance resembling graphite, but sometimes as though written with a red pencil, ordinary ink, or even printer's ink. Such is the phenomena in its simplest form, and whose reproduction, although not very common, is not that rare either, for there are mediums that can induce it very easily. When a pencil is placed together with a paper, one might believe that the spirit has utilized it to write with. But when only the paper is provided, it is obvious that the writing has been produced by matter put there by the spirit itself. Where did the spirit obtain it? We were led to the solution of the question of this question by this snuffbox example mentioned above. And we are reaching 128, but I'm going to leave this for our next week. <clears throat> and once again, we are very thankful for your presence, your participation, your support. And until next time, Godspeed to all.